As the co-founder of Permaculture, David Holmgren knows the power of cultivating seeds to full fruition. Here he shares how the principles of permaculture can help us transform suburbia into a thriving ecosystem, starting with a glimpse into what sparked the very beginning of this global movement of sustainable living. Uh, yeah, I suppose that's a long way back in history now. Uh, for uh, a lot of people, the, the mid-1970s uh, seems a long time ago. And it's perhaps surprising to people that when I was uh, a student in the Environmental Design School in Hobart in 1974, there was a huge interest in what today we would call sustainability. And that was a bit of a hot spot of it. It had gathered all the dissidents and radicals from the architecture and planning and landscape architecture schools around Australia, and it was possibly one of the most radical experiments in tertiary education in Australia's history. Uh, but there was this huge interest in organic agriculture, in intentional communities, in terms of the energy problem. It was one year after the, the oil crises of, of 1973 that didn't affect Australia that dramatically, but uh, changed a lot of thinking around the world and it was two years after the Club of Rome limits to growth report which really showed that industrial society couldn't keep going on the way it was. Uh, it was also, uh, 73 was the year that E.F. Schumacher wrote the very influential book on my thinking, uh, Small is Beautiful, um, Economics as if people mattered. So a lot of these ideas were around uh, at that time and uh, my interest was really in the overlap between landscape architecture as a, a design profession, uh, the science of ecology and the practice of agriculture, how humans get the vast majority of our basic needs is from agriculture. Um, or agriculture in the broadest sense of the word. And I could see how two of these things came together, but not how the three of them came together. And it was at that time I met Bill Mollison, who was not actually teaching in the, in the uh, even the, the uh, university where I was, he was at an, another university. And through that uh, relationship we started to gel the idea of what became uh, permaculture and it really is that contraction of permanent and agriculture we're using the word permanent today people would use sustainability the idea of something that was enduring and didn't deplete its resource base yeah, you were looking for something that would kind of replenish itself and, and continue on in a, in a holistic sense. And was there, were there, uh, you know, w describe a moment. Was there a moment for you and Bill where you went, wow, like you were kind of exploring these three elements and then you realized, wow, there is something really powerful in their convergence? Well, I think it was different for, for myself uh, from him. He was a generation older than me. He had a background in wildlife research before that as a fisherman and a hunter and um, rabbit trapper, uh, timber cutter, whereas I was uh, in my early 20s, well I was actually 19 when I met Bill Mollison and you know I'd come from a, a background of a family of political radicals uh, grown up with a view that yeah we don't necessarily belong and think for yourself and uh, don't accept just what you're told, but a lineage of uh, about trying to stop the world we didn't want. And Bill Mollison had had a toe in the water of environmental activism too for five years before I met him and was already at that point where I was of, no, we want to just create the world we do want. Very interesting. Uh, so that was an important sort of political, if you like, unity of of strategy of where we're at, even though we're a generation uh, different. But, you know, in, in some ways for Bill Mollison, the seed 
of the idea of permaculture might have been a long way back um, in the 50s when he was working in the uh, studying uh, wallaby ecology out in the forest living uh, in the rainforests and had a bit of a breakthrough in thinking about how the ecosystem actually worked and had maybe in a, a modern sense it might be seen as a huge hubris of gee we could design one of these that is an ecosystem yeah. um, and it's just Mollison was one of these huge thinkers constantly throwing up ideas, but it wasn't till um, I met him and I explained this idea I had about this overlap between the profession of landscape architecture and the uh, uh, practice of agriculture and the science of ecology. And he said, oh, well, that's interesting. He says, how about this for an idea? If most places nature creates a forest as the most efficient and uh, permanent form of uh, ecosystems on, on the land. Why doesn't our agriculture look like, or at least function like, some sort of a forest? And I said, oh, well, that's exactly, that fits exactly with what I'm interested in. So that was like the seed of what then became uh, the manuscript that I worked on for two years that be, became in 1978 published as Permaculture One. Very cool. Uh, Interesting that uh, that at the base of both of your work together was this notion not just to push against what wasn't working, but to actually to create the possibility of what could work, and that where you found that was where it was already working in nature. Yeah, that nature was the reference point for permaculture of where are the design rules. Uh, the energy laws that govern natural systems because we knew from that larger sort of ecological analysis that humans are actually subject to all of those same rules anyway. Even though the modern world had given us the illusion that we weren't. Uh, so understanding what the design rules and the sort of success pathways that existed in nature uh, was really the big wellspring for, well, that's how we need to design uh, something uh, that works for humans. The other big source for permaculture in terms of inspiration was indigenous and traditional sustainable land use that had proven itself over long periods of time. Yeah, ways that had been working all along that we just diverged from. Yeah, very much so. And that ranged from understanding the uh, land use patterns of uh, non-agricultural people like the Tasmanian Aborigines and Mollison had a particular interest and, and knowledge in, in that area. That w so we were discussing back then the ideas that a few years later were coined by Rhys Jones as fire stick farming, that Aborigines were actually deliberately managing and manipulating uh, nature rather than just wandering around um, uh, accepting the system as it was. So there was both that view that how do we work with nature and not be so extreme in intervention as trying to sort of wipe away what we don't want and replace it with something else. Uh, but on the other hand, recognising that even hunter-gatherer peoples we're actually managing the landscape for human benefit as well as uh, larger um, uh, purposes. Great. So working with what's there, but then also, uh, you know, working with it to create what, what's needed. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. And um, you mentioned some of the sort of fundamental kind of laws of nature that govern the principles so that, of what has become permaculture. Can you talk about just a couple of those? Yeah, well, it's a simple one. The, uh, one of the ways of framing one of the principles um, I do is to catch and store energy. Uh, now, energy is not just a metaphor, but actually the underlying measure in all natural systems for power or capacity to do anything. No ecosystem exists without a source of energy um, and usually multiple sources of external energy. 
but th those energies come in pulsing and chaotic ways. The seasons of the, the sun intensity in, in summer, especially in a temperate climate, dry seasons, wet seasons, effectively rain is an enormous amount of embodied energy, far more actually than in direct sunlight. You don't get farmers saying, oh, you know, like what's your solar radiation on your farm? No, how much rainfall have you got? That, you know, is a huge determinant of what's possible. But these things come in waves and pulses that are then not available. So all things in nature catch and store energy for later use. Whereas in the modern world, with regular income going into the bank, whether it's the dole or receipts from uh, stock market investments, people have become used to the idea of a steady flow. Go down the supermarket, get tomatoes, just a few tomatoes for this week, and it'll be the same next week right through the year. So the idea of the pulsing erratic supply of money, food from the garden, anything, is foreign to us. But in natural systems, we see everything is catching and storing energy for later, later use. So, by its very nature, permaculture is evolutionary, and you know it's 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 evolving. And how has it changed? How has it evolved since when it was first sparked in 1973 to what it looks like now today? Yeah. Well, obviously, the germ of that was was starting with. Uh, agriculture and how we produce basic uh, human needs. But implicit in the beginning was that of permanent culture as well. How do we redesign the whole of society, uh, not just our provision of our food and our basic material needs, but the way we organise and distribute uh, things, the, 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 the patterns of uh, living. So permaculture has been popularised, especially in Australia, as a cool form of organic gardening. And in a way, that's a great success in that it's almost sort of known by the general population in some form or another. But as a design system for both sustainable living and land use, it's really encompassing both the production side of the equation, but also the consumption side of the equation. What are our attitudes, what are our behaviours, all the things right through to what in permaculture teaching has been called the invisible structures of economy, uh, the way we regulate what we do. So that's part of an evolutionary pattern to becoming, you could say, a theory of everything, <laughs> of, of redesigning everything. Uh, and it's the nature of whole systems design that if we're looking at fundamental changed conditions in the future of what's sustaining humanity as it moves from the stored millions of years stored sunlight of fossil fuels to again re running on renewable energy, then we have to actually redesign the whole of society. And the other aspect of that is this tension between top-down versus bottom-up. Because when you say the whole thing, that often people tend to mean, oh, well, let's work out the way we organise global finance first. Whereas a lot of permaculture strategies are actually from the bottom-up. How do we reorganise our own lives first? Not just because that's where we have power and control, but because that's a way of understanding how whole systems actually work. So it's, you know, crawling before you walk, before you run. Uh, and I think the principles of permaculture have definitely evolved in terms of how we articulate them. If we look back in the early books, there's not actually a, a clear, simple articulation of, of permaculture principles. So there's been an, an evolution through uh, permaculture teaching over a long time. The other very important aspect is that there's all these other parallel ideas that are in society, some with a longer lineage the, than permaculture, um, some of them associated with the organic movement like biodynamics, 
uh, some aspects um, that are relatively more recent, like biomimicry, uh, which has influenced a lot of um, post-industrial large-scale design. How can we design things so they actually work like natural systems? Um, many, many sort of parallel ideas that have, where people have used those frameworks to develop aspects that we can say in permaculture, oh, that's a, that's a great idea, let's incorporate that too. So permaculture has become this um, framework for collecting a lot of different, um, if you like, design strategies and solutions and as well being influenced, continues to be influenced at a conceptual level by all these other related ideas, rather than it being this closed reference point that only came from some original source point from you know, working relationship between myself and Mollison in, from 1974 to uh, 78, because it was that short uh, period that we worked together in that way. And permaculture's gone round the world and been reinterpreted in very different cultural and social contexts. Uh, so it, it is in some ways, in its demeanour at least, very different in different places. Very cool. I, I love that it's sort of a constellator of, of, the, of many different streams of sustainable thought right now. And it's a container, it's like an arena where, where all, you know, all those element, or relevant pieces can, can come into play. I, I loved what you shared and I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about, you know, if we're going to redesign the whole of the system of humanity or of society, that's oftentimes really overwhelming for people. But, you know, wh where do we start as individuals to actually yeah. impact that? Yeah, well, the experience in my own life has been that the most powerful things I've done are in the way I live personally, the way you operate in a family, at the household economy level, the non-monetary economy of uh, growing food at home, uh, cooking, uh, caring for children, maintaining space, all of these things that used to, before the modern era, was the basis of all economic and social activity, was actually the household. So getting that working well and reflecting uh, those underlying principles, uh, where possible avoiding debt, um, focusing on as much as possible home-based lifestyle, uh, moving away from a mediated uh, nocturnal existence to uh, a direct experiential um, uh, daytime <laughs> existence. Uh, maintaining um, health and fitness by physical work to provide one's needs. So all of these things, of course, work very, very well when we're talking about the raising of the next generation through immersion in that world rather than it being this sort of intellectualized idea. So permaculture is at one level very abstract systems thinking, but at another level it's actually just dealing with the very, very most practical basic things. So often that can be a sort of like almost a household audit. Okay, where's things coming from? Where's things going to? What are the loops we can close and, and simplify and stop the leakages uh, of energy? And one of the findings that comes out of that experience is that it, it's easier to go a lot further and deeper with that in a larger shared household than it is by one person. Because the economics of scale of one person households really limits what can be done. And the other aspect of course is that people have realised that by community uh, there's a huge greater capacity that, that builds to do things. So it's ironic that most of the things we have in society, our food production systems, our cities, uh, everything is too big a scale to be sustainable, and yet our households are too small to be sustainable. <laughs>
not our houses, <laughs> they're the biggest in the world, but our households. Uh, so working ways to look at those very basic things and of course for a lot of people one of the things that can be done at home uh, is gardening and, and food production and it, it has a, a huge direct pragmatic connection to nature and even the bad aspects of it of fighting weeds and pests are metaphors for our larger fighting with bits of nature that we don't like. So it's like bringing all those big system problems back home to a little scale where we have a chance of actually, uh, if not solving them, then at least working with them and uh, experiencing things that might then contribute to a larger, uh, a larger solution. One of the reasons you're here is to share um, uh, a talk and some work around transforming the Australian dream. Speak a little bit about that. Yeah, this work of focusing on suburbia is a return in a way for permaculture because in the 70s there was a strong interest in, in permaculture uh, in suburbia. But the unfavourable social conditions that emerged in the 80s led the the active locus of permaculture shifting to the countryside, the back to the land movement. But there's now a lot of recognition that for a lot of people, adaption in situ or moving from the city to small towns rather than remote rural properties, or moving in some ways to living arrangements where people are actually closer together, is, uh, works better for a, a lot of people. And the fact that we're going to be dealing with the unfolding crises of peak oil, climate change, economic contraction, basically we're already in that unfolding crisis in many places in the world. So we are going to adapt some way in situ. And there's been a very negative view about suburbia and, and about houses on um, extended blocks as being unsustainable and uh, wasteful of resources. Whereas from a permaculture point of view, we see that there's huge opportunities for adaption and incremental household-based adaption, rather than waiting for society to all agree we need to live in a different way and that we need a completely different economy, that people can get on and do that who actually see that need. And uh, a lot of that can happen, uh, yeah, where people are. So my Aussie Street story is showing how that actually happens in an Australian uh, suburban street. Tragically, a lot of the opportunities for that in our larger cities, especially somewhere like Sydney, have been eliminated by this double the monocultural density, put another house in every backyard, if not the apartment blocks, which is Yes, we can retrofit all that too, but it's a lot more difficult. And that the action has moved to the regional towns and actually even our smaller towns and villages where that template that we think of as like suburbia actually still exists. So even somewhere like Mullumbimby is actually part of that um, uh, Australian dream that people don't call it suburbia, but it's like the suburbia I grew up in, in the 1950s and 60s. Interesting. So, so for people out there, whether they're here in the small town of Mullumbimby or they're in a, in a suburbs anywhere in the country or in the world, for that matter, who are listening, what are a couple really simple things you know, that people can do or, or be differently to start to look at their, their block of land or their, you know, and, and, and their, their household and, and, and start to shift the way they're working with that arena and environment? Yeah, once we go out in that sort of global scope, people's context is so different. But at least for the billion or so middle class people on the planet, there's a lot of commonalities that permaculture can address by not so much brilliant biological solutions or even eco-technic solutions, 
but by behaviour change and change in the way we see things. You know, for the 15 people in the Soweto taxi saying, put another 15 people in the taxi, it's pretty difficult. But a lot of us can, you know, uh, share our car, you know, pick up other people and have a fourfold increase in efficiency and a, you know, massive reduction in cost by just better use of what we already have. So many times when we're gardening, we can go out and the things we're pulling out as weeds, well, actually they're edible and they might be really health giving uh, if we know how to cook them and use them. So there's been a, a huge explosion of interest in uh, edible weeds. Now what these things, these simple things do, when we look at our immediate environment and say, what are the, the opportunities that I'm not seeing? What are the abundances that nature or just society is not valuing that I can take advantage of? Because when we do that, we are getting a benefit for ourselves, that's obtaining a yield. Uh, we're also living lightly on the planet because we're not going, no, I don't want that. I want what is rare or not available. So everywhere recognising those abundances that are around us that don't require the mediation of the market uh, economy. Oh, I need money to get this that is controlled by some filters that I can't get access to. And I think seeing those uh, opportunities and, and starting with those things, and they might be as small as, oh yes, there's things growing in the garden that I didn't even plant that I've been pulling out that could be added into the salad. Uh, and of course for children, also that is an incredible lesson. It's this, oh yes, I can actually have a direct positive relationship to my environment. It doesn't actually require all those complex filters of uh, approval and money and uh, whatever. So, of course, what those opportunities are will be very, very different in, in different places. But I think that that's uh, uh, one that's uh, there certainly at least for the billion or so middle class people on the planet. Mm.